We are live. Hi guys, thanks for joining. This is Essence of Medicine. Today we're going to be talking about character and culture in a healthy organization. I'm Amanda Armagost. I'm Dr. Abasi for Essence. And uh, it's my pleasure to actually introduce uh, Randy uh, Roach to our podcast. Um, Randy and I, we have worked uh, closely together in the last six months in a hospital in Kansas. And uh, I can tell that after uh, observing Randy's uh, system, I'm a little bit of a jealous, but uh, Randy should introduce uh, himself and uh, uh, tell us who he is and uh, how he's qualified to talk about creating a culture in an organization, a healthy uh, culture in an organization, especially in a healthcare organization. Please, Randy. So uh, if, if we're trying to uh, build our credentials or, or, or qualify our credentials, I'm not sure I'm going to have much, much success in that, but I've been in, uh, so uh, Hamid, I appreciate the introduction and yes, we've gotten to know each other over the last six months or so. And um, it's been an exciting time. And, um, you know, I'm excited about talking more about our I apologize. Uh, I'm recording this so we can podcast it later. Go ahead, please. So I'm excited about, you know, our our continued relationship. But, um, you know, one of the other things I'm excited about is is developing relationships with new contacts like Doug and, um, you know, the with all of the frustrations. Well, let me give you a little bit of background. So I've been in in healthcare in some capacity for since 1990, I guess, um, some at points out of healthcare and and exploring other ventures, but healthcare related entities and businesses since 1990 um, shows my age a little bit. But, uh, um, you know, over the years, my my focus has really been on creating organizations that work well and uh, um, even at times when I've been out of healthcare, I get drawn back in. If you're if you're wired for healthcare, um, it's hard to resist the pull. And if you're kind of mission driven, it it really um, healthcare allows you to live your mission uh, in your vocation too, which I kind of get a double bingo. So, um, but you know, with with the frustrations that we have in healthcare, a lot of it is around communication. It's around you know, creating organizations that perform well. And so a lot of my studies in my adulthood have been around that. Um, and uh, when Dr. Abbasi invited me to participate in this podcast, we'd been back and forth with some emails about culture and character. And um, I've gotten to know, know Doug Cowan, uh, Dr. Cowan, over the last month or two. And um, I'm really excited about some of the things that he's doing, and uh, it, and probably because it, it uh, validates maybe some of my thoughts and concepts. And um, you know, Doug's one of those guys that I feel like, in the short time that we've known each other, we could probably finish each other's sentences most of the time. Um, so, so that's exciting for me. Um, but yeah, Doug. Um, Doug is an ENT in, uh, uh, in, uh, Kansas city and he's got, he's, he's, he's engaged in several different business ventures. One of them, a physician owned hospital, but Doug, why don't you give us a little bit of background about, you know, your professional life and how did you get into the entrepreneurial side of, of medicine? Sure. Thank you. Thank you all for having me, Hamid, Amanda, Randy. Um, sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit, but um, when I was asked to be part of this podcast and it was about culture, it was like, yes, like quickly for me, because I feel like it's such a such a big piece of of our organization and, and honestly is is the, you know, the main driving force in, in what we've done. Um, so I'm, I'm an ear, nose and throat doc. I did not set out to be part of a, you know, a huge enterprise like we are. I joined a small group and over a short period of time, it, it's been eight years, but short period of time, it's, it's grown 
tremendously. And that's really because of, I think, us caring so much and, and doing the right things for patients, doing the right things for our physicians, doing the right things for everybody around us. And in essence, it's created this culture um, organically. Um, and now looking back, that's really a key to our success. And so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's quite a large organization. It's completely physician led. A lot of people say physician led. This one really is. Um, and, and we're really proud of what we have. And, and when we speak with people that talk about culture or talk about how, how great things can be in certain organizations, whether it's medicine or many other organizations, like it, it resonates completely with us. So, you know, I've had a, a, a great pleasure meeting with Randy and having these conversations and, and we literally can't stop talking because it's, it's very similar, just the way that we think and the way that we care about everybody in the organization. Well, I'm very happy to have you both here because I'm, I'm, I have been in medicine now for over 35 years. And, uh, you know, I have seen in multiple countries how the medicine is practiced. And uh, each obviously each place has its own advantage and disadvantage. But at the end of the day, it is a, it is a service that we are providing. And uh, contrary to many other jobs, um, we have direct contact with lots of customers. We call them patients. And, uh, and, and certainly um, what we provide is that uh, it requires a lots of technical skill skills. But I noticed myself that in many cases that we doctors, good doctors, we learned how to communicate with the patient. Mostly we are able to uh, just be like a human when we talk to patient, but once we get out of the room and the, the, it's, uh, the patient is, uh, the door to the patient is closed, we are, we are just different people. We are just, um, we behave differently toward the patient versus the rest of the team often. And I wanna give you a little background about that. And I wanna tell you that is not by chance that um, lots of doctors, a lot of uh, surgeons by default are not the best communicators. They are not the best, uh, I would say, um, human resource leaders or administrators. There is a reason to that. Now, um, you may know that, uh, that the country that doesn't exist anymore more called uh, uh, Prussia, it was a part of the German empire. It's, it, it doesn't exist anymore because it, their the territory partially was absorbed by Russia, part, partially absorbed by uh, Poland. It was a main part of Germany, as a matter of fact. Anything you think of German, it wasn't German, it was Russia. And obviously they were uh, uh, German speaking and they had the very best, very uh, most disciplined military. The, like the Kaiser Wilhelm was a Prussian, the last Kaiser of Russia. Now, what if I told you every surgeon in Germany used to be a Prussian officer? That it makes sense because they would be in wars. They were the people who needed the surgeon mostly. And the culture of medicine and surgery, especially surgery, is very much uh, impregnated, uh, disciplined, and uh, organized like a Prussian army. And the Prussian army was known to be very disciplined and like very well tuned, but they weren't very uh, well known for their <laughs> bedside manner. Bedside manner of human skills. And I can tell you stories that this change that we are, that we surgeon are not like a Prussian officer, army officer, that we are not like them. This culture, this is new. Until not long ago, you and I, all of us, we know that the people we used to fear surgeon. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and um, I, there's uh, lots of stories, and I can give you two of that. Um, in Houston, that Dr. Debeki, who did some of the cardiac things, 
used to have a line around the hospital. If any resident would be caught outside of that line, they would be fired like a like mm -hmm. a military bar barrack, you know? If you are outside of the military line, you would be fired or shot or executed or something. There, this is this is the people who are role models for many of our surgical discipline now. There is mm -hmm. another role model. His name is Dr. Harvey Cushion. But bless his heart, he invented the new neurosurgery. But let me tell you a few things about Dr. Harvey Cushion. His resident, they were not allowed to marry. They had to have Dr. Cushion permission to get married. And one of the doctors got married to a nurse in secret. When Dr. Cushing found out, asked him to come in and told him uh, he's going to make an exception because he's, he has looked at his uh, performance. His performance hasn't come down. He has been married. But then he reprimanded him that he at least could have married a lady. So can you imagine something like that happen today? These are stories that I want, I'm telling here so people understand the old way of especially surgeon getting trained is not, um, is not nothing you are, you, anybody is used to. And, and that system create a lot of very highly compot, very potent surgeon, very skillful surgeon, but not exactly very, <laughs> on the human side, very versatile or, um, and, and creating, and what, what we found out the hard way, this surgeon now try to play, I'm saying not be, but play administrator, and they all miserably fail because you need different set of uh, skills in the war than outside of the war to deal with other people. Another uh, sad story and joke or unreality is that surgeons are amongst the highest number of airplane, private airplane fatalities. Have you guys heard that? Oh yeah. Aerodynamic yeah. doesn't care that you're trained under Dr. DeBakey or Dr. Cushion. Aerodynamic mm -hmm. doesn't care how pro prolific you are as a surgeon because surgeon get used to, they say jump and everybody say hi. A aerodynamic doesn't care about that. And, and that I think has led in the last 20 years to lots of, I would say, not miscommunication, but a lots of conflict between surgeon, doctors, and administrator. And that is what I, that is what I like to talk about. Why we are so in discord, in discord, and we are so, disconnected. We all plan the same thing, provide care. And this is what I like to talk about. Why, why are we here with such a huge friction between doctors and administrators and uh, surgeon and administrators? And how can we overcome that? Randy, I, I know you have dealt with lots of surgeons and can tell lots of stories, but I, both of you, I want to know your experience with that or your thoughts on this. Well, you know, um, there's there's no doubt that the training and the rigor that surgeons go through, um, we're all we're all a product of our history, right? We're all a product of the environment from the time we were born and 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 through our education and um, the the rigor and the discipline it takes to get through medical school, get through a residency, get through a fellowship, it is significant. And, un, and not unlike the military, you know, the, the discipline approach and the approach of the military, if you think back of, of and I think, I think uh, medical schools and residencies are evolving, but it used to be, as you've described, medical school and residency was very milita militaristic in their approach. And the, um, the, the kind of the concept was they break you down so they can build you back up 
you know, into the into this model that that was the model of success. And unfortunately, um, the you know, the product of that, it can be it can it can be one that from an emotional intelligence standpoint, you know, they you might not you may be building a great technician, but they may not be great at at leadership. And and Doug and I and Hamid, you and I have had this conversation about leadership. You know, one of the frustrations and one of the things that, frankly, that I, I, I think about when I wake up in the middle of the night frequently is where does this this animosity and the frustration, where does it come from? And, and then secondly, what are we really trying to achieve? And I think one of the you know, one of the things that is 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 challenging is the physician most of the time is probably right in their approach. Their vision of what on how to fix healthcare is probably correct, or at least a big part of it is. Um, it depends on the physician for sure. It, yeah, but the frustration, the frustration Sorry, and the headbutting I agree. How we get there can be so difficult, right, Doug? And so so okay. how do we how do we evolve from and I and I shared a story with Doug about so I went to uh, Physician-Owned Hospitals of America, PHA. They've now rebranded a, a few years ago. So the rebrand was they, instead of being, being Physician-Owned Hospitals of America, they became Physician-Led Healthcare for America. And so I thought, oh, this is, this is smart. They're trying to rebrand so that, that the uh, American Hospital Association and the insurance lobby um, is less effective in their message that all of these greedy physicians that aren't making enough money now need to own hospitals. So they're trying to move away from that. And so I went to the first meeting after their rebrand, and you know what I found? That wasn't true. I was in a I was in a conference full of physicians that were passionate about healthcare, passionate about their patients, passionate about evolving models to be, be better stewards of the resources that we have. And we're sitting together with physicians who are, who are maybe an exaggeration, but foaming at the mouth. They're evangel evangelistic in their approach, but they're sitting right next to administrators who, who were wired the same way. But they all came out of an entrepreneurial environment that, Hamid, you're, you're a part of, and, and Doug, that, that you know, you're a part of, in that they've broken away from the status quo and the the um, employed model, and they're and they've got entrepreneur they've got an entrepreneurial spirit. They're economically aligned. You know they've got reasons. They've created structures where people are incentivized to behave in a certain way because it's good for everybody. Yeah. So Doug, why don't you talk a little bit about what your experience has been? You've grown from. You started in a small practice. What's your practice look like now? How many employees do you have and locations? And what does that look like? So when we started, or when I started, I, I came out, I think, 14 years ago, 13 maybe. Um, and it was five five docs and maybe 20 to 25 employees. And it's it's grown through a lot of, you know, as you can imagine, headaches, red tape, all kinds of things, but, you know, pushing through because, you know, we, we wanted something better. Um, it, it's been incredible. We're, we're, we have 50, I think 55 physicians, 110 to 120 providers, and, you know, including all the APPs and audiologists and speech pathologists and a, a number of others, um, over 500 employees now. And, you know, you know, every every sort of level comes with a lot of different challenges, you know, and success stories. And, um, you know, in a position now where it's still like, what what are we going to do next? You know, and, 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 and why are we going to do what we're going to do next? And, you know, for us, a, lo a lot of what we do is is because of the, the people that we like. Right. So why do we go into emergency medicine? as an ENT group, it makes no sense, you know, from a, a business model. But when you have some amazing emergency physician docs that have a great idea, in my opinion, and they're good people, and you know, they're going to, they're going to own it and and take it and, and, 
and do everything they can to make it work because they're great people and because they care in the right capacity. Like I'm willing to, to go at risk with them on that, you know, same thing with pulmonology, same thing with, you know, a number of specialties that make absolutely well, pulmonology makes a lot of sense with ENT for other reasons, but a lot of specialties that we have are because of the people that wanted to help build that specialty, you know, mainly physicians. Um, but they came along with a lot of support staff that helped them grow um, and and develop into something into what it is today, which, you know, we're still not perfect by any means and we never will be, but it, 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 it's all these stepping stones that get you to a point where you have people that love going to work where they work and, and want nothing more than for the organization to do well because they provide such great care for patients and, you know, the staff love it. Um, the physicians love it. And, and, for sure, that's what I'm most proud of. And it's for sure not all me at all. And and um, I'm just, I'm really happy to be part of, of what we're doing. It's almost like this thing that's in motion that I couldn't stop if I wanted to, not that I want to stop it, but it's sort of taking its own, its own sort of realm. Um, you know, I, I think what Hamid brought up about DeBakey, I think is, is an important piece for sure, you know, in, in history, just, you know, it's funny, you know, my, my least favorite rotation was general surgery. Um, and it was just, it just was nasty ish, you know? And, and I think they're kind of, they kind of were all trained in that way. I mean, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, which is not always what you want, you know, from a, you know, a business person, which I'm definitely more of a physician than a business person, but I'm wildly optimistic and so when, when I see, when I, like, I love that history piece, but like for me, it's like, I don't see that as much now from like the new general surgery residents, like history, somewhat bad history in, in some instances, like, especially the way they treat people, not necessarily patients, but just like their own residents and colleagues and things like that. That's going away, I think. And, and I don't think it's ever coming back, you know, and it's, and slowly. it's going away very slowly, yes. but it is going away, which is it's just something away. to definitely take note of. I think now people are kind of waking up to, yes, you are at this level, but we're all at like, we all need to be here. So you need to treat people pretty much respectfully. And Ali, your son, he kind of attested to that. Um, I don't, you guys might not know, but Dr. Abbasi's son is, uh, in school right now for surgery. Nice. And he, yeah, and he's doing general surgery, right? Yeah, he's in general. San Francisco, and I, I think he has the nicest residency I have ever heard of. Yeah. I say, you know, my 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 thoughts on that is, yeah, maybe you come out of it and you're still a human, you know. <laughs> right. But, but that that's the but culture. You know, I think Doug. I think one of the things you're describing is so true. You know, it used to be that when you got out of your, your residency and fellowship, you, you reached the pinnacle. And, and those were the credentials that propelled you into your career. Mm -hmm. It almost feels to me like that is becoming the permission to play. Agreed. And, and what propels you in your career is how well you can work with people to get things done. So um, Pat Lencioni, um, an author that I've read off and on for probably decades, but um, Pat Lencioni talks about the ideal team player. And if you can imagine a Venn diagram and the Venn diagram is humble and humble is easy. We know what humility is, right? It's lack of arrogance. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so you, so the ideal team player has a, an equal balance of humility. They're hungry. And when I say hungry, I don't mean greedy. You know, they're not working to they're not hungry because they always want to acquire more. They're the they're the person that you got to kick out of the clinic or the office at seven o'clock at night, not because they're they're workaholics, but because they just love making a difference. They're there because they love to make a difference. And then the third and then the, the third circle in the Venn diagram is smart. And it's not until it's not IQ, it's EQ. It is how well they can work with others to accomplish their goals, to get things done. So equal part, humble, hungry, and smart is ideal. Um, and, and, 
you know, one of the things that our HR person does is when she brings people into interview and whether they're physicians that we're recruiting or they're people that we're renting, interviewing for customer service roles, she lets them sit out in the, in the lobby, in the waiting room. And the, the CSR that's at the front desk observes their behaviors. Do they look people in the eye? Do they engage people? Are they smiling? Are they, you know, how do they behave when nobody's, you know, when they're not interviewing? Now so you think, gave it away, Randy. Yeah. Tricks <laughs> don't work anymore. Uh, I know Stephanie's got some more tricks. So She's I, got more. I, I, um, this, is, this reminds me of, this is a few years ago, but, you know, we were hiring a lot of people and interviewing, you know, you know, from front desk to positions, you know, and, and a lot of other areas in between. And it's like, how do you, how do you pick somebody that, you know, is going to do the right thing or, or just intentionally is just going to like help. And, um, there was somebody shadowing in the room with a patient and I had a, I had some documents and I think it was labs and imaging and I dropped them on the floor, you know, accidentally. And I'd been down to pick them up a nurse in the room helps and this individual that was shadowing not even a movement and i'm like ooh, this is kind of a good one to see if it's a knee-jerk reaction like are they really somebody that wants to help in, in any situation it's like opening the door for somebody or saying please or thank you it's it's these things that you you sort of learn hopefully from your parents and and interactions when you're young but it's really hard to teach yeah. unfortunately later in life and and so, you know, it was a joke that we would just do that in interviews and just drop something on the ground and see if they make a move to pick it up, you know. And and anyway, it's it's those little things that I think are interesting because I noticed them and it makes me definitely, unfortunately, judge somebody in the wrong direction if they're not somebody that's like trying to help. Amanda, take notes. Uh, we have to have a we have a plate of something <laughs> that you know, oops, accidentally <laughs> drop it. And see how they behave. Yeah, for sure. that's actually you want thing. people that want to help for sure. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Now, um, no, obviously, medicine is a very is a very complex machine, and not every piece in medicine, like every piece in the machine, is what comes what 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 you can look at or interact directly. I'm sure they are part of this big machine that are so technical that uh, human interaction becomes less important than some other areas. I mean, I'm not an administrator for a good reason because I'm not good at it. I'm, and I'm a, I'm a doctor and I'm a, I want to stay a doctor. And, uh, but it's good that we have an administrator and we have a doctor who is an administrator. And I'm, today I'm going to learn from both of you. But, you know, uh, what areas of medicine, it's not just made out of doctors and nurses, but and certainly wanting to make an impact is a big factor. But in one area, do you think that uh, that that ability to connect to people is more important? Like, does your coder needs to be have the same abilities like the front desk people and so on? How do you uh, choose that what level? Because I cannot imagine you have enough of those highly emotionally intelligent people that can, that, that like, you know, I have, after eight years, I can say that I have a, less than a dozen of them in my organization, people with high emotional intelligence. And that is the concept that we understand only in the last 15 years. We always knew for 150 years, we know what IQ is. But the idea of emotional intelligence, being able to read, empathize with other people, that is a new concept that, and we haven't developed our society yet good enough. So people you get with good emotional intelligence, they are, I would say, naturals. People who are naturally are born and it's natural. That, and the, I, I, please just don't tell me that you have such a huge access to them in, in, in comparison to other area of the in our country, but this, you told me a few tests about how you choose them and they are trivial. You can do that, like put seeing them, observing them when they are not interacting with you directly, putting them in a situation, see if they're going to chip in and 
want to help and so on. But um, how, how do you how do you adjust that level of necessity for EQ versus IQ? I want to put that question for all three of you because so, I've, I've been doing some of that job for us yeah. as well. Go ahead. So I feel like I may be talking too much, but just just I, I think it's an amazing question. Um, and you know, having a, a fairly broad number of physicians in the practice, it's like who who are the the folks that I'm continually hearing about and and needing to somewhat intervene, you know? And it's it's honestly, it's the docs that don't have that EQ, right? the the docs that are very much you know people persons and and those that you'd want to have anybody interact with you would feel safe having any of your patients go see because you know they're gonna have a good experience not just have a good outcome but have a good experience because their their whole team cares about that individual and i think you know that team around the physician they 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 read off of the physician, right? And so if the physician, you know, outside of the room with the patient acts differently, which which I heard, you know, I heard you say earlier, is like they see that. And I think that at a certain time, you will start weeding out people that do maybe have EQ and you'll only get those that want to be around that physician that have IQ because they're not seeing the lead by example from the physician. And I would say, those those are the physician teams that we struggle the most with, and it's it's blatantly obvious. You know, we 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 meet. We have an executive team that has, you know, five or six docs on it, and and six or seven, you know, admin folks that you know, I I try to get people in the room that basically are very high EQ. We don't measure it, but you can you know, like you can just you feel it. You can tell. You know, like meeting with Randy, just like what you said, Hamid, it's like, like he's got it right. He's he's he he he's easy to talk to. He's one that understands people. He's humble, no ego, um, you know, and, and wants what's best for individuals. And if you have a leader in a sense, even if it's a leader from a physician standpoint of their team, even if it's a small team, an MA and a nurse or, you know, an APP and you know, a couple of nurses or a, somebody that's very highly productive that has, you know, 10 people on the team, it's it's pretty easy to see the teams where the leader, in a sense, the physician in that instance is is very emotionally intelligent because that sets the tone for the whole team and, and makes the patient interaction that much better if they're all on the same page. Well, I like to challenge you a little on that that it is obvious that they have eq it is obvious to you because you have the tools and so on but you know for iq you have a test i agree i can put that test among 100 people and that test comes out with a number that we understand what that number means they we have standardized that for eq we have not done that so as something that come e you know, easy uh, because you have that naturally you have maybe that that tool may not come naturally to others. Randy, I want to know: is there a benchmark that you can you know you go me some example? But um, are there tools available for organization, not necessarily for a person who has hired uh, five thousand people, but for organization is getting into that? Are there tools? to measure EQ of a person and see and use that to put it in context. I mean, obviously, if somebody is just repairing my ventilators and has no contact to anybody else in any other regard, I really care about his IQ of fixing the ventilator rather than human skills of, and so on. So you see, as an organization, you need a variety of people. For sure. We as well, we need as well those Asperger's people who have no human skills like me and have more technical skills. But what tools are available, Randy? So, yeah, that, I think there's a two-part answer to that, maybe. So one is, are there tools? There are. 
you know, the, the, I've used Profile XT, I've used Predictive Index, I've used MBTI, I've used DISC assessments. There are behavioral assessments that can help. Most of those assessments, what I found, are better coaching tools than, than they are selective tools for determining whether you should hire an employee or not. Um, the, but it's amazing how many times an employee will, will I'm just struggling with something about them and I'll pull out their profile XT or their PI or whatever tool we use. And it's like, it's right there. I chose to ignore it when I hmm. hired them because I liked something about them. And it's like, well, this is the part that's driving you crazy. You know it would. And so I think those tools are, are great coaching tools. And I think they're, they're helpful in developing people's EQ and their ability to work together on a team. So are there are questionnaires. Tools. Can you explain? Yeah, 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 they're questionnaires. They are questionnaires. Uh, the, uh, but the second part that Doug kind of alluded to, and, and I, I suspect we all caught it, but, you know, in American politics, there's, there's a saying, and I'll probably butcher it, but the, the public has exactly what we deserve right? That we've got the representation that we deserve in politics. And uh, that's kind of indicting, but it's also, I think, um, it's also true in organizations. What you've got in your organization is a reflection of what you've created. It's a reflection of the leadership. And one of the things that I think is misunderstood by many, many physicians, many physicians complain and grumble because they don't have a seat at the table. They're no longer in control. And how are we going to get control back and all of, And what they don't understand is they're still the most influential person in the organization most of the time. Send an administrator down the hall and send a doctor down the hall at the same time. Who do you think everybody's paying attention to? It's not the administrator. The doctor still has influence. So when they're bitching and Pardon me, sorry about the language. Okay, but you can say swear words. When they're complaining no, this, about this something, is... when they're complaining about something, they are influencing the people around them. When they're frustrated, they're influencing the people around them. So the behavior that comes out of their frustration can either be a positive on the organization in how they respond or a negative. I'm reading a book right now. I'm actually finishing one book. It's called... Um, Oh, shoot. I just um, the untethered soul. And it's uh, so it's not written from a um, from a religious perspective, but it recognizes the psyche and the soul. And and it's been really helpful for me because it's I don't sleep very well at night. It's hard for me to kind of shut things off. So I'll fall asleep at, you know, 11 or midnight and then I wake up at two thirty in the morning and I can't go back to sleep. And I used to write things down in my in my phone or make notes so I could release it and go back to sleep. But the this book has been really helpful for me to train myself, my psyche, um, to calm myself and be able to, to help me sleep. And if it can help me go back to sleep, it's got to be helping me with dealing with other issues through the day. Um, it's called The Untethered Soul. Um, the I think, though, the what we have to recognize as leaders, and I'm putting us all in the same bucket, physicians and administrators, we're all leaders. And in fact, your scrub tech in the OR might be the best leader you've got in that room. You don't have to have a title or power to lead. And that is something that I think we misunderstand. The best leaders are people that influence. And, mm -hmm. and it's just how, you know, you've got the influence. You've already been given the influence as a physician. It's what you choose to do with it and how you influence people. And I think that's one of the things that I'm so intrigued with Dr. Cowan and what he's been able to do with his organization, where you're, you guys have kind of reached the point where you don't even have to recruit physicians anymore, recruit staff. You've got a waiting list of talent because people, you've created a culture that people, it's like a magnet. People are attracted and want to be a part of it. So you can be selective. And I think there are instances where, Dr. Cowan, you've, you've passed on physicians that want to come to work at your place because it's like, you know what, we just don't think you're a good fit. And you've asked, you've asked some physicians, not that they're bad people, 
but they don't fit the organizations. You've asked some physicians to to give up privileges, haven't you? Correct. Yes. And and I, you know, when when you talk about culture, I feel like a big piece of that is being nice and giving people a lot of chances. And and I struggle, you know, with that piece, you know, also I mean, giving too many chances probably, you know, from a business perspective, it would have been done a long time ago, but I believe in people. I want them to do well. I believe in second chances. I've had plenty myself um, and wouldn't be here without them. Um, but, you know, somebody in the organization that is that is is very negative or is going against what you want in the organization, if you don't remove them, um, and, and it can be a, a very, you know, you can do it in a nice way, in a cordial way. But if you don't, you know, it literally is, you know, and this term has been used a ton, but it's like a cancer for the organization, because if you keep people and 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 those around them see that you're keeping these individuals and they act in a way that that is not what you want, they'll start, you know, judging you almost on, well, that doesn't these two things don't align like you want this in the organization, yet you're keeping this individual and allowing them to. To, to treat people in a negative way, they, they don't align. And and I've learned to try and make those changes as soon as possible. I mean, certainly the conversations are had. This is what we expect. This is not happening. And like, like you probably won't be here very long if this behavior continues, even if you're the highest producer in our hospital. And that happened. And, <clears throat> and you know, it's tough financially, but it's the right thing for the organization. It's the right thing for patients. And, and you know, the whole executive team judges me in a way that's like, you know, you have to get rid of this person. Like, yes, let, let's do it. Dr. Cowan, if, if, do you or, or Dr. Abbasi, do you have a, a, a prescribed set of principles or values or behaviors um, that you've determined are, are fundamental to your organization? Have you, have you gone so far as to actually define what that looks like? Tom, you go with that because I think you are farther there than I am in that regard, creating mm -hmm. that culture. I'd say, I'd say we have, um, but, you know, I, I wish it was, a little more well-defined, you know, we, we've written it down. We've, we've shown it to the organization, but it's been probably seven years since we've done that and yeah. things have changed and different people are involved, but it's a lot of the things like we're, we're talking about, but it, it could be very much more, you know, defined and, and way more, you know, like showing examples of what we mean, not just saying, Hey, we don't like, you know, ego doers. We don't like people, you know, we don't want people that, are are doing things, you know, on an island for themselves. We we want nice people, like you know, in a sense, yes, we've done it. But um, you know, to your to your, I think point, Randy is, we don't do it as well as we should, and I and I we should do it better. And so one of the one of the things that's been helpful to me is uh, I recognize so actually in two different organizations so. When I was leading um, Oxford Senior Living, we were hiring hundreds of employees a year. You know, we were just blowing up with growth. And I went to my CFO and I said, Chris, um, I'm, I need to hire a champion for, for our culture because in our business, we claim that our, we claim that our people were our differentiator. Our competitive advantage, while we had great buildings and a nice layout, the concepts, you know, we had a great product, but we claimed that our people were our differentiator. If they were, then we've got to do a better job of setting expectation about what that looks like and how we develop them. And so I said, I need to, I need to hire a champion that that is what they focus on. So I'm going to, I need to hire a full-time HR person. And he challenged me and said, we don't have the budget to do that. It's like, oh, my gosh, that's going to cost us $60,000. blah. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. You and I are thinking about two different people. I'm not talking about a $60,000 person. This person is going to be expensive. And I knew mm -hmm. who it was. It was a guy that I'd worked with at KU Med years ago, 
that uh, he was one of those guys like you guys that I said, someday we're going to work together. Mm -hmm. Four years later, I called him. I said, Todd, remember when I told you that? Yep. And I said, today's the day. Took me nine months to get him, but I recruited him away from KU. We are still like the best of friends today. Um, but uh, when I hired him, we I knew that we needed I needed somebody that saw the culture that I saw and he lived in, and breathed it every day. It's one thing for you to be the leader of the organization and talk about it, but you've got a day job. You guys mm -hmm. both have busy practices. You've got surgical practices. You've got all, Hamid, you've got, got, you know, you're developing, I don't know what all you're developing, good no. Lord. You're developing AI models. You're developing product, you know, for, or implants. You're you know, you're developing 3D printing equipment and all this. You've got so much stuff going on. Culture is not, while it needs to be consistent, in your behavior, it's not your full-time job and you need a wingman. And, you know, it was Todd Lewis for me at Oxford. A big woman. At Summit, it's, it's uh, Stephanie Trump. Stephanie's been phenomenal, but she lives it every day. So when we're having conversations, because not all of your staff is going to understand this, but when we say that we're, our expectation is our people are going to be purposeful, collaborative, accountable, and trustworthy. What does that look like? So when we have coaching conversations, when we see behaviors that we don't think are consistent, we talk about those things. Do you think that decision was purposeful? Was that intentional? Or did that, was this just a chain of events that you allowed to happen? So how could we have intervened quicker? Are we collaborating across silos? Are we creating silos and we're, we're you know, hiding and, and not being transparent and we're not working together? So if our if collaboration is one of our core tenets or, or expected behaviors, are you being collaborative or are you are you fearfully owning that responsibility because you want to protect your 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 intellect and intellectual property or whatever it is, you know? And so it, I'm not going to go through all of them, but our conversations when we coach team members. We tie everything back to what, what we agreed are our values. These were the things we agreed on, right? If they're not, then let's change them. Mm -hmm. But they have to be, Hamid, I think you, I think you, when we you started this talk, you talked about that people want to, people want, it wasn't genuine. What was the word you used? I mean, it, of course, Andy, I don't know. Was it genuine? It wasn't transparent. <laughs> Amanda, help me out. That, that people that listen to these podcasts want... You want to be want, genuine. They want to listen to what's in your heart. People appreciate if you come and they not... I said, don't shy the controversy, but right. just be genuine about your beliefs. And yeah. Because people are interested in that. So you know what? People's BS sniffer is pretty well developed. And if, the, if there's not consistency, it's better to not have values in your organization then say these are our values and you don't live by them. Yeah. Right. Now, the, the, the Doug, you talked about that, you know, even those high performer, once, if they're not team players, um, you, it, it, they, in, in the overall, they are, det they are detrimental to the system, to the whole organization. You did not make that up. Every study after study shows that this high performer, like, a group of people who are a better team together can perform much better than a group of people that higher intelligent and higher performer, but they are not working as a team. Do you know who found about that? The Navy SEALs. Right. It studies about that, that mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how your personal you know, abilities are. If you cannot be part of that team, the whole team will suffer and die, literally. So. Mm -hmm. These are well, well distinguished. And I'm going to tell you a secret that we rarely admit uh, online, that I'm a product of Carvey Cushing system. Mm. I'm, I'm educated to be able to take the tumor in the, from the brainstem of your child and save his life, but I'm not trained to perform and uh, to be among people but and that I learned myself the hard way that 
all my technical abilities are meaningless or mm -hmm. less efficient if they are not in an environment that create a team. Yes. And guess what? You know, you talked about the wingman and I said wing woman. And one of the questions I'm lately asking Amanda very often is that, Amanda, what is your gut feeling about this person? Mm -hmm. and she very cautiously told me about the person that that person is a walking red flag and I'm about to hire that person. And when and I, I said it so many times, Randy, I'm telling you, I was telling Hamid every time we had a conversation, I'm like, please, no, like, this is what I'm seeing. This is what happened. Like, you, this is what's going to happen. He, oh, give it another chance. Give it another. Randy, I'm telling you, I tried so hard, but we succeeded. Amanda, you know, when people have the technical competence that I kind of think I'm because I'm a simple guy, right? So God gives us a bucket full of, of talent, right? And our talent, some of us have more EQ, some have IQ, and some, some have technical skills, some have people skills and all those things. Some of your buckets are bigger than some of our buckets, but, um, but the, you know, the people, people that have been trained and have the skills that Dr. Bossy has are going to gravitate towards people that have technical skills. People that are probably wired more like I am are going to be looking for for those that are that have that 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 have some of the soft skills, I guess, that I think are are necessary. But in certain roles, you got to you can't have an IT person that's just got great soft skills. They've got to be able to <laughs> to work on the computer. You know, you can't. I don't care how nice a surgeon is. I want the guy that is the yes. best surgeon I can get or gal in the OR. So, you know, you got to have both. But I think one of the things Dr. Abbasi is, is how do we lever all of our skills? And part of that is creating clarity about where we're going. I think where we get sideways with not just those who we're leading, but our peers and our strategic partners, you know, administrators and physicians is make sure that we're very clear about where we're going and what the expectations are. And then if we're clear about the expectations, we can work together to get there. I'm going to have some skills that, that you don't have, and you're going to have a lot of skills that I don't have. So how do we lever those? Let's not, let's work out of our strong suit. Let's not work on our weaknesses so much. Let's work on the things that we do well and surround ourselves with people that are better at the other things than we are. Um, Randy, I really appreciate, first of all, that you say very nicely that God gave us a bucket and uh, that bu talent bucket of talent can be more in the IQ or EQ and so on. Thank you for apologizing for lots of surgeons. Because no, that's not the way it was meant. Please don't get me in trouble here. <laughs> no, Randy, you're okay, because that's actually exactly what I say, too, is we all have like this much skill. But it just is, where is the skill going or where is our knowledge going? Well, I got to tell you, so so Dr. Abbasi, um, a good friend of yours and, and a mentor of mine and a business partner of mine, Jeff Turner, who was the um, was the head of, of Boeing Wichita for, for a, a great period of his career. He's got advanced degree after advanced degree from the best universities in the world. And you would never know it talking to him. He is so humble, but his, his, he's got a big bucket. You, you usually wouldn't be able to tell, but he's got a, he's got a big bucket, but his superpower in my opinion is the ability to read people quickly. And, and he's got an ability to understand understand how to work with people to, to, to help them achieve what they want. And, and thereby he gets, he has success. You know, when I've asked him about what was your, when you broke off from Boeing and started Spirit Aero Systems, you know, started a company, became the CEO of Spirit. How did you have success with that? That should have failed like a hundred times. How did you have success? And, and humbly he says, I figured out that my, big, my biggest strategic partner was most people's biggest enemy, which was the union. And he said, I made sure that I made friends with the union. They could trust me. I may not tell them what they wanted to hear, but they knew I was a man of my word. And when I said I was going to do something, I did it. 
And he said, you know, I figured out how to help the union achieve what they wanted, understanding that the company also has to be successful. So he, he a big part of his success was working with the union. You think working with doctors can be difficult? Work with the labor union. <laughs> now, I'm talking about, you know, leading. And that is, I think, you know, Jeff is truly a marvelous man. And I think truly his superpower is um, to be able to um, em empathize with the other side. You know, I don't want to use the word enemy, but you know, the, the best way to win a challenge or whatever you want to call it is to know to be, to make a deal with anybody. You have to know what is the what is the other side craving best. Mm -hmm. That is. Part, that part is having empathy. And I think yeah. that is what truly makes him different than many people. And I think, Dar, I think that is as well as super strength you have. And probably, I'm not sure if you know it or not, some people have just skills without knowing they have that those skills, is that I mean, you can empathize with a large group of people. Mm -hmm. that you, you, this comes to you so naturally. I'm just telling you, this is not. This is not uh, the, uh, natural that people can create a team like that without the skills. You did. Uh, you go. You did go to med school like I did. Right. I can guarantee that your med school did not teach you no. these skills. So this mm. must come natural to you. And uh, the, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the many uh, physician um, they are good at the technical side but they are less educated or trained on the other side. And that is where the partnership come, comes. I agree completely. But, and, uh, and once, but that is like, a, if your heart is in the right place, once you have a small team, mm -hmm. just propagate. It just becomes bigger and so on. And that is what I notice in my organization that, you know, for a long time, I'm, I, I think I'm going to use your words, uh, uh, Randy, I'm bitching and complaining about you know, why are we not there? Why why are we missing and con not considering? I am the problem. I put the people in charge that are walking red flags and I don't get rid of the people who are red flags. Yes. And then I get upset about why is why are things not happening? And obviously, you know, and that is a, like a vicious circle that goes on and on and on. So... I, I really salute you that you have been successful to put that together. But as well, I think uh, my learning uh, days are not over. No. <laughs> and just being able to say that you were wrong, you know, I, I've messed up a ton. But as long as you learn from it, you know, and, and, and your heart is in it and you want what's best for everyone around you, like you, you start making the better decisions or, or realize somebody needs to go or, you know, there, there, there's a lot to it, but, you know, you, you push through in the right direction and, and things I feel like go very well. Now that interesting part is that I can tell you on the medical side, I created a system that no mistake, no bad experience goes unnoticed and unlearned. I have a database. That I literally write down every that I gather lots of data. It is really this dichotomy is even interesting to me that on the medical side, which I'm trained, yes. I have this system, a self-correcting system. That's right. And every month we look at the data and we, but on the human side, I I I I don't I don't I don't have the tools. And if they walk with the, uh, Amanda's words. The, the, the person doesn't have red flags. The person is red flag, walking red flag. And I saw all the signs are there. And I still, as you said, there are skills I see there that I think it would be good for organization, not considering that the organization is not just made of me and that person. It's made of bigger group of people and the biggest engine on a, on a, the, on, a, on the wrong car it's going to just destroy the car rather than provide energy for the motion. Well, right. but I, I guess that is where Amanda comes from. Amanda, I think, is an empath like you. 
that uh, yeah. <laughs> so lately I have been outsourcing my EQ and uh, once in a while Amanda gets a uh, just a text from me what what your gut feeling about this and that and so on I think we can as well surround ourselves by people who have better skills at those things that we are lacking and 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 as well it uh, use those information so well it has been truly a tremendous uh, uh, you know the advantage uh, you know a really privilege for me to listen to both of you but I, I, I like as well, you know, to, to, we'll hear from um, all three of you, actually, including you, Amanda, in your organization where you are, where do you see yourself in one, three, and five years? What are what are those goals? It seems that, you know, you know, on the human resource part, which is, by the way, the most expensive part of yeah. any business, uh, we know in one, three, and five years, what are you planning to do with the with the with the skills, with the emotional intelligence, and with the team that you have built? Where do you plan to go? Doug, do you want to start? I think he was asking you. <laughs> okay, I can start. Um, so it's really hard for me to say like a good idea of where I will be in one, three, and five years because our organization is changing so rapidly. Even if you asked me this six months ago, I wouldn't be able to predict where I am today. So I think in um, one, three, and five years, I would like to become more of a leader, continue my HR role. I don't want to be the HR person. I really enjoy the role that I'm in right now where I kind of have my hands in a lot of buckets. I would like to kind of be his or her, her support person. Um, I would love to be a part of the expansion and just really upping my marketing side as well. I feel like right now I take on a lot of administrative roles and I don't get to do any marketing. So I think in that's like one year, one year is more HR and more marketing. And then in five years, I would really like to have a full team with multiple HR people where we can, like Randy said, actually write it down. Like, what are our values? What do we identify as as a group and uh just continue that role but that has a question for doug and randy you know uh, you have the tools one three five years how are you going to put those tools to the best use in the next in the in the near and maybe midterm future so so probably a an easy <clears throat> excuse me generic answer but i, I i've learned that it is so crucial to surround yourself with, with great individuals. Um, that that that's been one of my main focuses, even for the past two years, and it's showing. You know, in 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 certain meetings, in our executive meetings, the the level of conversation is so much different from instead of talking about problems and not bringing solutions to the table. People are coming with solutions and then talking about what problems they can solve it's a very different conversation and and really my goal is to help to continue to help them you know support them however i can to to keep doing better and feel like they're really making an impact because that, i think ultimately that's what people want they want to go to work and feel like you know one they're really well liked by their colleagues and that they are free to make mistakes but they're also free to to do amazing things, and and I want to I want to empower them more and more, you know, and 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 have it be that I'm not as involved. I, I still want to be involved, but I I want an organization where I'm I'm at the table, but I'm not the one driving, you know, all of the decisions. And, and we're we're getting there, and and I'm really happy to 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 be at this sort of turning point because. Because I really want that for our organization. It's better for the organization if I'm not the one making the majority of the decisions. Randy, I want to know from you as well. Well, some would probably argue that I should retire. <laughs> How does it work with me? No, no, no. I, just... I, I, I don't allow that. You can't retire. <laughs> I don't ever see that happening because I love what I do. And and it's and I don't know if I'm trying to fool myself. I don't believe so because I wouldn't I wouldn't consider myself a workaholic. 
I don't go to work because I'm not fulfilled in other things that I do. You know, um, I have lots of interest outside of work and, and work is not my identity, but I love making a difference. You know, I love to, to have an impact. And so I told you I was, I, I'm just finishing a book um, called Untethered Soul. I also uh, just started another book that a good friend and, and uh, another mentor um, from years past of my uh, years past wrote, um, and it's called A High Impact Life, and Pete Oaks wrote it. And um, I started reading it and knowing Pete really well and kind of watching his transition through life and the impact that he's had. Um, it's, it's interesting to read his book and uh, or to, to begin reading his book. And one of the comments that he made that's sticking with me is when he was younger in his 40s, while his he had a, a drive you know, a mission, he was mission driven, but he still treated what he had as an owner, which I see as a good thing, you know, treat it like it were yours, treat it like you own it, treat that resource like, and one of the things that challenged me was he said, he's evolved his thinking from, I'm no longer the owner, I'm the steward. This is not my resource. Nothing that I have is mine. I'm a steward of what I've been given. So I think, you know, recognizing that we need to cultivate a culture of stewardship where we treat, where we take care of precious resources. And whether that's our people or whether it's the, you know, the gifts that you've been given as surgeons, whether it's, you know, it, it, whether it's your accountant or whoever it is, but steward the resources that we have and frankly, steward healthcare resources. I think that's what's so frustrating to physicians and to administrators that, that are, are in healthcare for the right reasons. What's frustrating to us is see the lack of stewardship and the waste in healthcare. Mm -hmm. I've jokingly said for years, if not decades, one of the things that's attractive to healthcare, if you're in a manufacturing environment and you go to do a turnaround, you're trying to figure out how to squeak out a percent here and a percent here and a percent. Healthcare is like, geez, you don't have to be that smart. Open. There's 20% here. There's a million there. It's like, oh my gosh, you don't have to be a great operator to, to make improvements in healthcare. So, you know, I think that's, but that's one of the, you know, there's a lot of low hanging fruit, but I think working together to change a system that is so broken. And I think that's, you know, that's what I want to accomplish. And I, and, you know, I don't think that things, things, uh, there are coincidences, but I think a lot of the times relationships and people are put in your life for a reason. So, you know, Dr. Bossy and Dr. Cowan, when, you know, when I connect with people like you and I see the innovation behind an inspired spine and I see the patients in our hospital and the, and the impact on them and they're walking down the hall two hours after surgery when they've been turned down because of a high BMI and all these comorbidities by some of the best, some, I won't say some of the best, some of the most recognized surgeons in the country have turned mm -hmm. them down and said, we can't do anything for you. And we can. So to, to be able to take that throughout the country, you know, to take those technologies, to be able to team with some, with a, a surgeon like Dr. Cowan, who gets it when it comes to how to build healthy organizations. And, and it's, and to me, it's like, Dr. Cowan, you're no longer building organizations. They're just growing organically because of what you've developed. You know, they're they're growing not on their own, but you know that. So so when I look at at the the folks that have been placed around me and mentors like like you know Pete or Pete Oaks and Jeff Turner and, and folks like that, I think there are some phenomenal things that we can do. My fear is not over the next year to five years. I wish I could rewind the clock 20 years and have the opportunity I've got now. Yeah. But yeah, I do think you said I really love that we are steward, not the owner of our resources. Yeah. And um, that's know, a hard one. That's a hard one for me, by the way. <laughs> but the second thing, you know, what if you could turn the time 20 years ago, but not for yourself, for a young group of people that they can be your mental like, children and they yeah. take your legacy. So I cannot go back 30 years, you know, I nobody gave me a chance when I was a young man. 
but I can be the person who gives lots of young people exactly a choice to be the best version of them. And I enjoy that. That is, I think in my one year is obviously e expanding my service, teaching what I do to other surgeon, because uh, the, I, I, I know we can help lots of people, but th there are more of them than I can manage myself. I need to uh, give the skills to other people. So I'm very proud of our so-called soft transition where we train this new surgeon. But as well, I'm proud of my 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 group, like Amanda or the Misha or uh, or Jimmy or Kurosh, that practically they are my version 30 years ago, and uh, I cannot go back in time and use all the knowledge and the resources I have now 30 years ago for myself. But I can make sure that they now have those resources, and by giving them the, the, these resources. They did. We are have a group that we are planning to change lots of ways. Spine surgery is done. Medical documentation is done. Um, the, the, how we clinics are built and so on. So by putting effort and the resources in young people, I know everybody complains about oh young people, young people that they, they are so this, they are so that. It was a really interesting that the presentation. That person was reading. Uh, how old people are complaining about young people. At the end, it we found out he was talking about Socrates, Aristotle, Caesar, people 2,500 years ago were complaining about young people. But at the end of the day, everything, uh, everything comes from young minds and inventive minds. And I think that is what I want to be a steward of. I want to not own them or control them, but uh, give them opportunities that I didn't have myself. So I'm hoping that that actually um, is something I can do in the first, in the next one to three years. Well, it has been a tremendous privilege, uh, uh, Doug and uh, Randy, have you both here. And uh, one day I would like to invite uh, Jeff to tell me about all his uh, the secret sauce. I mean, uh, there's a lot we can learn from him, but uh, it is getting late. And thank you so much for joining us for this episode of uh, Essence uh, of Life. Correct, Amanda? No, it's this was Essence of Medicine, Character and Culture and Healthy Organizations. I think that fits more to Essence of Life, but, you know, we, <laughs> it's, sorry, it's, it's, a, sorry, it's actually it's medicine. It's done. <laughs> okay. It's Awesome. Yeah, Thank you. So, all. Uh, so Dr. Abbasi, I'm, I'm excited for you to get a chance to meet Dr. Cowan face to face. I suspect that'll happen pretty soon. Great. And uh, yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to find ways to work together. So, well, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to meet you, Doug, and I'm hoping Same. That we can meet soon. Randy, please share my information so we can, Doug and I, we can contact and hopefully um, within the next few uh, weeks or maybe next time I'm there, we can uh, the, the meet as well in person, hopefully. That would be great. That'd be great. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Randy. Thank you all. Amanda, thank you, thank you everyone. I appreciate you facilitating this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Have a great Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.